Welcome to the Food Junkies Podcast. Here, we aim to provide you with the experience, strength, and hope of professionals actively working on the front lines in the field of food addiction. The purpose of our show is to educate you, the listener, and increase overall awareness about food addiction as a disease with abstinence as the solution. Here, we talk about all things recovery. Most importantly, how to thrive rather than just survive. So stay positive, make a change for yourself, tell others about your change, and hopefully the message will spread. Today, we have Kathleen DeMaison. Kathleen is a compassionate coach, a social commentator, and cultural visionary who understands the essence of addiction in a compassionate and revolutionary way. She developed the concept of sugar sensitivity and transformed the way of looking at food as a healing agent in addiction. She designed the Radiant Recovery Community to support sugar sensitive people who are following the seven steps to healing outlined in her books, Potatoes Not Prozac, The Sugar Addict's Total Recovery Program, Your Last Diet, Little Sugar Addicts, and Your Body Speaks. In 1998, before the social networking of today, Kathleen set out to build a worldwide community of supportive sharing. She has empowered hundreds of women and men to collaborate with her in providing support to thousands daily. In today's episode, Kathleen shares her story. She addresses food interventions for substance use disorder. They talk about the research of the past, present, and future, sugar, the potato, the neurochemicals, serotonin, beta endorphins, and dopamine, her seven-step plan, her thoughts on intermittent fasting, keto, plant-based eating, her thoughts on the word abstinence, how she works with clients, 12 steps and her thoughts. She's celebrating 50 years of sobriety, her book, Little Sugar Addicts, how to respond to those who think we are creating issues by telling our children no when it comes to sugar, what she's working on next, and our signature question. Welcome, Kathleen. Okay, welcome to the Food Junkies podcast. My name is Dr. Vera Tarman, and I am your co-host today along with Clarissa Kennedy. Today, we are speaking to Kathleen de Maison, the author of the best-selling book, Potatoes, Not Prozac, along with her other books, The Sugar Addict's Total Recovery Program, Little Sugar Addicts, Your Last Diet, and Your Body Speaks. Many of us know Kathleen as being one of the first to present to the world back in the 1990s the concept of sugar sensitivity and how this can explain addictive eating as well as severe depression and obesity. In fact, it was De Maison's theory of sugar sensitivity that led Bart Hobel to promote the premise the first scientific ever studies on sugar addiction. His early work led the way for further research by his graduate student, whom we all know and love and hold in high regard here at the Food Junkies podcast, Dr. Nicole Lavina. It turns out, I didn't know this, Dr. Maison was their starting point. She's also the founder and ongoing leader of the International Radiant Recovery Community, a fellowship of people who follow her principles to heal their own sugar sensitivity in order to live a life of radiance. Welcome, Dr. De Maison. Thank you very Thank you much. Very much. So I'm gonna, we're gonna, we always like to start with the personal questions first. You have identified yourself in your writings and in your interviews as a former sugaraholic or sugar addict. Do you mind, can you just give us a paragraph or thumbnail sketch about how you came to realize your own sugar sensitivity, how you found your recovery in basically the baked potato? Okay, so we'll start off with a minor correction. I don't think I've ever called myself a sugaraholic. Or have I used the term former? <laughs> so I would call myself sugar sensitive and that I discovered the idea of sugar addiction having an effect on me, which is a function of my biochemistry as a sugar sensitive person. So the sugar sensitive person part doesn't go away. The biochemistry of it is significantly changed based on whether or not or how much sugar I'm having. So that's an important context in thinking about the story. So my father was an alcoholic, and the chances are very high that if you have a parent who's alcoholic, that you will get that biochemistry. And I certainly got that biochemistry and really did not discover the unusual power of sugar in my life until I was an adult. That as a child, I just had a regular life and 
rode my bike and roller skated and went to school and did those things. So the story is really one of being a regular person. I got married at a really young age. I had three children by the time I was 25 and got divorced by the time I was 25 and started a whole process of figuring out what I wanted to do. So I went back to school and I got a master's degree. And then I had a life in a nonprofit in public health administration. And that took me through a series of iterations that eventually ended up in California running a rehab center. And I went into that. I was hired in order to fix the place as an ultimate codependent task, which I was up to. And so I had an intern who was from Stanford. And I said to her, go to the library and just find me anything that you think would be interesting. And I found that while I was there, I was spending a lot of time working with the clients directly, that it was very compelling for me. And I kept thinking, particularly for the guys who were multiple offenders, why would they not be able to get sober and stay sober? Like what was going on? And so one day this student brought me an article that I think it was Joan Matthews Larson's original paper. Like it would have been one of her very first. And there was one sentence in that paper that made a connection between sugar and alcoholism. And that was the first time I ever heard of that. And I hadn't, I hadn't had anything to drink for 20 years at that point. So I just never had thought about that. But when I read that sentence, something happened. And I said, oh, that's very interesting. So I started asking the guys how they ate. It was very simple. And nobody ate breakfast. Everybody ate huge amounts of sugar. Nobody ate regular meals. I didn't have any idea of its meaning or whatever. I just was curious. And I thought, let's try something. And at the same period of time, literally in the same two-week period of time, somebody gave me a diet. Some of us are always interested in diets. And so I started the diet at the same time I was listening to the guys. And the diet was do everything all at once on the first day. Abstinence, that serious stuff, right? But after about two weeks of crawling through every day, after about two weeks, I kind of woke up and I thought, I feel totally different. So I went into the guys and we just started playing this game. I said, write down what you're eating and we'll talk about it. So we started talking about it. And it was fascinating because they realized they brought their little food journals. In, and these are guys. Guys don't journal, but it was so much more interesting to them than having to talk about alcoholism. But they did it. They came in and I said, all right, let's start eating breakfast. And none of them could cope with that. They just said, no, I can't cook. What do you mean? So the guy that I was working with was in recovery and he had been a meth addict. And he said, okay, let's make shake. So he taught them all to make shake for breakfast. And that's how it started. Just literally, they started eating breakfast. They started eating food. They started being able to pay attention. And the other significant difference was that I did not require that they go off of alcohol. I just said, you can't come to group if you've been drinking. So they would be not drunk at group. So I gave them these steps to do. And when they got to the sugar step, I said, okay, alcohol is a sugar, so now you have to give up alcohol. And every single one of them got sober and stayed sober. So that's the story. I mean, it's just, and after about three years of doing that, I said, holy moly, Batman, there has to be something here that I don't understand. But these are people who are multiple offenders, and now they're sober and they're staying sober. So I decided to go back to school and find out why. And that was, you know, I was 48 at that point and I quit my job and I went back to school and developed a whole theory about why the food made the difference. So you're saying that you found that when you dealt with the food, the alcoholism was a trust. So you think sugar is a key piece for the alcoholic as well. I don't think it's just sugar by itself. I think that what we were doing was that taking the sugar out was taking out the primer, that what 
the food, so having enough on time of good food created a biochemical stability that allowed them to hear the other things, the treatment. So it wasn't that the food cured the alcoholism or going off of sugar. Like if in some places people are taking people off of sugar as part of alcoholism treatment, and all it does is create chaos. So it's very important to me that that distinction is made, that it isn't just taking out the sugar, but the sugar primes the same brain chemicals that alcohol does. Well, and it also makes sense that even treating people with nutrition for their disease would help heal their brain, which would allow them to then, like you said, listen to treatment, you know, coping skills better, retain more information and be more functional in building a routine, which we know recovery you know, thrives in when we have those like three meals a day. So it's a very fascinating piece. Can you share with our audience uh, more about the experience of writing your PhD and the book Potatoes Over Prozac? It's potatoes, not Prozac. Okay. (laughs) um, Oops. (laughs) It's all right. So what I did was crafted a theory of what the biochemistry was. And I did that in a way that was very thoughtful. I was a a real PhD. It wasn't a mail order PhD. It was honest to God, read and read. And I was doing school full time. And I was reading nutrition literature, neurochemistry literature, addiction literature, particularly opioid addiction literature. And I put together a theory of what what is a sugar sensitive body. It was a hypothesis. And if this is true, and if we do this with nutrition, this is what I've observed. And then the PhD was doing that and actually statistically measuring what changes occur. So how did depression change? How did compliance with treatment change? I mean, it was pretty amazing. I mean, when I look at it now, it was serious numbers. And I hired somebody to help me with statistics and she said to me, oh, for God's sakes, you don't need a statistician because your results are so profound that it's pretty evident that what you're doing works. So that was very powerful. And I had decided I went to school because I knew that I needed to write about what I was seeing. So I went with that intention. And then I wrote my thesis and I thought, OK, now I have the data and I, I will have the credibility because That was 30 years ago. And I can tell you, nobody or maybe one or two people were even thinking about sugar and they were being laughed at as being foolish. And so I decided to write a book about what I had found and started writing and got somebody to help me write, learned how to write, which was, you know, a pretty serious process. So when it was time to present the book for publication, I didn't just have three sample chapters. I had a book. And so I did some research and I sent the manuscript to 30 people that I thought might find it interesting and asked them if they had any thoughts or ideas. And what was really intriguing to me was I got a email back from Christian Northrup who said, this is the best thing I've read in 20 years may I introduce you to my agent? And I thought, well, okay, that sounds good to me. But like, I honestly was pretty naive at the time, but I said, okay. So she introduced me to her agent and he said, this is really good. Would you like me to represent you? And I said, yes, that sounds good. And literally within two weeks, he had people bidding on it or wanting to bid on it. And so we sold the book and that was Simon and Schuster. And I wanted it to go to Simon and Schuster because the person, the editor got it, that it was what the story was because the other people wanted to market it as a diet book. And I said, this is a book about addiction. And again, that was before anybody was willing to talk about that. So I said, no, I want it to go to Simon and Schuster. So that was the beginning of it. And it's, you know, now it's sold more than half a million copies. It's very under the radar, but like it, it never was a flashy book, but it's still selling, which is why it's been reprinted 
you know, three different times because it just keeps selling. So that's the story of that. Yeah, that's an incredible story. And like, so were you surprised then by how successful it did become? No. (laughs) You knew it was good. You had the research, so it makes sense. Well, the other thing is that when the book was going to be published, I hired some guys to set up a website. And they said, what do you want to do? And I said, I want to be able to build a community for people to talk to each other about how to do this. That was before Instagram, before Facebook. We had nothing. They had no idea what I was talking about. And they said, well, Kathleen, what what do you mean a community? And Like, we can make you a million dollars. Like, let us just do it. And I said, that's not what I want to do. I want to build a community. So I sat at the computer and have continued to do that every day for 30 years, teaching people how to talk to each other and teaching people how to do this program and teaching them what the steps mean and that this isn't about just abstinence and going off the sugar, that this is about recovery and what does that mean. And what an essential piece, right? We know like 10% is abstinence, 40% is like recovery skills, coping behaviors, emotional treatment, and 40% is community. And so at a time where really only community wasn't really being hugely addressed, you were already ahead of the time. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful. Yeah, see, that's an interesting equation that you just did. I'm not sure that I would sign those numbers to it. So I have to think about that. I think I would put biochemistry in there as half. That would be my guess. You would say 50%. Interesting. I would would say 50% for the biochemistry because my experience is, and not just in radiant recovery, but in other places, when people change the biochemistry, they're able to be in community. They're able to not do the addictive behaviors and they're able to learn whatever skills. And it really doesn't matter what the skills are. There can Mm. be a hundred different ways to do, well, not all of them are particularly necessarily good, but there are many ways to have, and many kinds of skills and many kinds of community and different styles. But for me, I mean, and this is what the real core difference is, is that you do the biochemistry first. Mm -hmm. And I say this to people who are trained as counselors and therapists. If you have your clients do the food first, you will look so good. Everybody will think you're brilliant because they have the ability to listen to your skills. That has 100% in my experience. (laughs) So can you talk to us a little bit more about the serotonin impact with carbohydrates? Because we certainly have clients who struggle with volume. And, you know, I've heard about the stretching of the stomach, creating serotonin, and, you know, that being the addictive piece for some people, even when they get off their addictive foods, being sugar, flour, whatever. So can you talk to us a little bit more about that? I would say that carbohydrates are a really key piece of recovery and that people who do low carb get themselves into really serious trouble because they feel great for six weeks and then they fall off the cliff. And serotonin is the brain chemistry that's the just say no chemical. If you have low serotonin, you say, I won't, I won't, I won't. And then the cookie is in your mouth and it's gone. Same thing is true with alcohol. So you want to have good levels of serotonin. And in order to have serotonin in your brain, you have to have carbohydrates because what happens when you eat carbs, the insulin reaction from it goes and changes what happens at your blood brain barrier. And so what it does is it, the insulin sends the large neutral amino acids off to your muscles to make muscles and tryptophan, which is a little one, is left behind and it doesn't have to compete with the other ones who are always pushing it out of the way. So the carbohydrate allows the tryptophan to get into the brain and creates the ability to say no. So what I say to people is if you eat carbohydrates in a particular way, then you won't crave them. You won't 
use them addictively. You won't get caught. And if you eat brown carbohydrates as opposed to white carbohydrates, which means whole grains, then you don't get into trouble. And if you can only eat small portions, then you eat small portions. You have a small potato, little one, just like you know that big. You don't have to eat a big potato. <laughs> oh, that's great. Endorphins play a role in our sugar sensitivity. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? So the equation in sugar sensitivity is serotonin, blood sugar, serotonin, and beta endorphin. And the endorphins are the brain chemical that makes us uh, feel good. And most importantly, it has to do with self-esteem. So if you have low beta endorphin, you will have low self-esteem, no matter what your life is like. Like everything can be successful. You can be happy. You can have your partner for life. You can have a good job and you will feel inadequate, hopeless, and out of control if you have low beta endorphin. So sugar evokes beta endorphin. And it's a painkiller. So if you're emotionally thrashing around and over, you feel overwhelmed and inadequate and ugly and fat, and you have sugar, you feel better. And anybody who tells you to just go off of those things, go off of sugar, go off of, I guess you guys would call it flour. <laughs> I, I don't do that terminology. I call it white things. If you do that all at once, then what happens is you're left with no beta endorphin Like your beta endorphin is low. And so you take all that stuff out and then you feel not only fat and ugly, but inadequate. So my idea is that we do the sugar down the line, do the white things down the line. And in a process, in the process of changing the biochemistry, teach people how to raise beta endorphin with things other than sugar, music, laughter, play, dance sex, good food, dogs, probably even cats if you're a cat person. I'm not a cat person. But so what I would be doing is teaching all of that. Then when people get to the going off of taking stuff out, I guess you'd call it abstinence, right? Down the line. Oh, I I can't use that word. It hurts. It hurts my mouth. I think that's the first time I've ever used that word in my life. Okay, wait, I have to recover from that. You take things out down the line. We'll, we'll call, I'll call it taking things out. So you take the things out, but then you have a whole toolkit to raise beta endorphin. And also, because you've been journaling, which is one of our steps, you know that if you feel inadequate, your beta endorphin is low. It's not that you are inadequate. You just feel that way because you had ice cream yesterday and it wore off. And so if you do other things, if you go for a walk, If you put on some good music, you'll feel better. So that's all very scientific, but it does work. So you would probably fit into more of our harm reduction approach rather than... No, no, (laughs) don't give me that title. She's uh, For those you can't see, she's freaking out. (laughs) No, no, I am 100% for recovery. I do not, uh, no, I don't believe in harm reduction. When you're dealing with addiction, it kills you. Mm. I'm 100%. It's just the timing of what you do when. Okay, so Move removal, not abstinence at yeah. the right time when the biochemistry is fixed and the person is ready to do the removal. Yes, yes. Beautiful. So all it's right. the best of all possible worlds. Okay. But, right, harm reduction Like, what is that? That means let's drink in moderation. I mean, but I think the problem is that a lot of people associate that, but it's like a best practice by, you know, the American Addiction Medical Association. (laughs) I've taken on more than (laughs) more serious enemies than that. I just don't. Why would you want to settle for? Harm reduction. I, the I do goal of the of harm reduction being abstinence, though, and just getting meeting the client where they're at, and then moving them towards abstinence when they are ready. <laughs> I'm yeah. glad we're having this discussion, though. It's very, very good because I totally disagree with that, and it's wonderful that we can have a disagreement. And yeah, I, I can say, look, if you came to me as a client, I would meet you where you are. And what I would say is, don't worry about the sugar. Don't worry about the alcohol. 
let's do breakfast first. I would meet you where you are. And if you couldn't do breakfast, I would say, there's four parts to this. Let's do the easiest. So I'd back the slider down to what you were able to do so you could succeed. And if I give you too much to do and you can't do it, you'll be gone. I'll never see you again. So we work on learning how to succeed and learning how and being around people who are in a state of recovery, who love life, who are not being driven by addiction, who are funny, who are irreverent, and they're skilled. And you listen to them and you say, I want what that person has. I want to be like that person. And then, and this is a lot of what I'm dealing with now, when those people go through what we've all been through in the last two years, have a really hard time, the new people can listen to what people who are in recovery do when they're overwhelmed and feel inadequate and want to drink and want to eat cake. Sorry, (laughs) you know, you just touched it. No, it's interesting because we have this debate largely in our field where, you know, I think coming, I like me and Molly come from, you know, addiction prior to food addiction. And so having people, you know, use methadone where we have seen their lives drastically improve and we're just not sure harm reduction is the appropriate word for food addiction. Would you have a better word of meeting the client where they're at? You know, for some individuals, they sometimes have to start with sweeteners and then transition to a place where, you know, as their taste buds start to change and their life starts to get better, where they're they're able to remove things in a transitionary way rather than cold turkey, cut everything out, which is sometimes the OA, gray sheet, you know, that kind of way. So where you sound like you fit in the middle ground, but is there a term for it? It's actually more radical than that. I wouldn't even call it being in the middle ground. Okay. Because what I'm doing is inviting people to practice impulse control from the beginning, but to not go off of sugar. See, the difference is what I say is let's add things in first and then take things out after you have stability. So it's a matter of timing. And I don't say use sweeteners. I say have the sugar and train yourself to take the charge off of it. Just have it. Have it at the end of your meal. Find the most boring sugar you can find. Yeah. And have the same amount. Now, I don't say that right away. I don't say that on step one. Right. I say get out of bed and have breakfast within an hour. Who cares if you're eating sugar? So on some level, I think what heals people is the... It just is taking the charge off of it. Okay. You know, now if somebody comes in and they're an alcoholic or they're using drugs and you come out of the same background, I will say to them, we need to take care of that first because you can't do anything if you're using drugs. Now, I have to admit to you, I've had this crisis in the last six months because everybody's doing behavioral addictions, sex, gambling, shopping deading and they're all crazy (laughs) how do we reconcile this and i took it to them and i say okay what do we do and they all started laughing and they said how about breakfast and i thought okay then that's exactly the point of just don't fret about all of that start with this piece so i don't Okay, to go back to your your issue about methadone, for example, I totally agree with that, that, but not for a lifetime. Because I would say, don't you want more? Why would you want to be tethered to a maintenance drug when I can give you the exact same thing without that drug and you won't be tethered to anything? And there, I would 100% agree with you because you are still tied to going to get it, still needing it, still having dependence intolerance. I think what we both would agree, it would be that it, it shows them a sneak peek of the life they could have without the chaos of being in full addiction. Correct. Yeah. Good. Okay. There we go. We're just solving world problems here. Okay. <laughs> 
All right. Do we want to talk about dopamine? We do. We do. So why are we so focused on dopamine? Is the real story the beta endorphin story? I think we're so focused on dopamine because Bart Hobel was the first person to write about sugar addiction. And he happened to have a grant to study amphetamine, which is dopamine. And so he was doing that. And then Nicole got excited because he she was in his lab and started publishing. And so the dopamine people, the amphetamine people, and the eating disorder people who are having the parts of eating disorders that are associated with activating dopamine got excited about it. And it's very functional. And beta endorphin is very elusive. It's a harder, more expensive brain chemical to catch. Dopamine is like a little sparkling diamond. You can go find it pretty easily. Beta endorphin is kind of like a little wisp that you try to touch it and it disappears. So it's expensive. And also doing research on food addiction is very expensive and very complicated because there's so many variables. So if you're trying to do measure serotonin and dopamine, and I mean, dopamine is so much easier to measure. So I think the beta endorphin story is the core story. And to me, I'll tell you very honestly, when I was first starting off and I was deciding which direction, whether to go and do research, and I had a conversation with my brother who was a senior official at a major drug company. And he said, oh, for God's sakes, Kathy, he's the only one that calls me Kathy. Oh, for God's sakes, Kathy, you have something that works. Just take it to the people and do it. Like, don't worry about the research. Just go tell the story. And you know, when I get a letter from somebody in Tibet and they say, I got your book. I'm trying to do the program. Can you help me? And I think, how did you get a book in Tibet? You know, like, how can that be? So that to me is a miracle. Yeah, well, you know, us addicts, we are really resourceful. And when we want something, we will find a way. That's exactly. And you know, to be honest with you, the core message, if you want to know what is my core message, is that we take that addictive skill and we flip it and we train people to use that skill for recovery. I mean, that's my essence of, you know, you are not inadequate. You're not dumb. You're unbelievably resourceful. You're very tenacious. You get what you want wherever you are, whatever time of day it is. You can do this. So Kathleen, can we talk about the potato? In our food addiction community, the potato gets kind of a bad rap because of its carbohydrate content. I'm wondering if there's anything we can substitute for the potato. I want to say that only sugar addicts ask me about substituting for the potato. Regular well, people just eat it and don't even worry about it. Guys, in particular, it's just like, oh, you want me to eat a potato? How wonderful. Can I put butter on it? Yes, put butter on it. But let's address it because that's a cultural thing that has happened in the last 10 years about potatoes are bad. They're just terrible. They'll make you fat. I mean, it's very simple. And that is just not true. Potatoes are, have been nourishing people for thousands of years. Obviously, I'm a fan of potatoes. Now, to me, it's very practical. If we have somebody eating terrible foods, lots of sugar, lots of refined products, lots of junk food, that trading off a potato is a really good step. And that if you're scared of the potato, and to go back to your question, what else can you use? Honestly, I have found that there is nothing that works as well as that silly little potato. Now, what you can do is not scare yourself and get a little one or just have a piece. And if you have it with the skin, you're not going to have a blood sugar spike, which is what you want is a blood sugar push that will move the tryptophan into your brain. Because what literally what the potato does is create a curve of insulin that sends the large neutral amino acids to your muscles. And little Mr. Tryptophan is left at the blood brain barrier and hops over and says, let me sacrifice myself on behalf of the serotonin factory. And so you don't have to eat potatoes for dinner. You don't have to eat potatoes at breakfast. You can be as scared as you want a potato. 
all day long, but in the evening, three hours after dinner, you have this little a little spud that people are shocked at what it does to them. And if you're scared of it, what I say is try it and come back and talk to me in 10 days. And just tell me if you feel different. And I've never had anybody say it had no effect. Now, the other side is I have had people, (laughs) I had some people who took the guys out into a vision quest and they went to Costco and they got two pound potatoes and they put them into the fire and they had a campfire. (laughs) The guys all had uh, hallucinogenic dreams all night long from the potato because hallucinogenic imagery comes from serotonin receptors. So they had a whole bunch of guys who were in early right about that. <laughs> who thought they died and gone to heaven because they had two pound potatoes. And I didn't say anything. I just thought, okay, it's all right. They can enjoy the experience. Well, you know, I would, I would go with that over the ketamine. So there you go. <laughs> you know what, Vera, that is exactly my point that no side effects. And here's the most important fun thing. Addicts love, we love to titrate things and play and figure out, well, if I do this or if I don't have this, if you have the potato, you can play with the size and the brand and the time of year and how much butter you put on it and all these things. And the worst side effect that you might get is vivid dreams, literally. So why not? Okay, well, so why not? So I'm, I'm going to play the devil's advocate here. You, you obviously know that there's a very strong keto and low-carb community out there who are probably the people who have uh, besmirched the poor potato because it's considered a white, heavy carb. And, you know, their argument is that the, the insulin, it well, I'm sure it's more than 20 grams of sugar that's in... I don't know. Right. No, I, uh, anyway, the, the, I'm sure they would say that, no, this is not good. So do you have a response to that? And what I would say is that I've been working with people for almost 40 years. And what happens is their diabetes goes away, their addictions go away, their mental illnesses alter, they go off medications, but I'm not testing it. And I'm not a medical doctor. And so it's discounted as being ridiculous. And I just say, that's okay. It's okay. fine. Okay, so we can agree to disagree in that larger context. But just just to wrap this piece up, so then the sugar, refined sugar, that's the beta endorphin overload, or yeah, basically that's what it is. And the potato or the diet that you're promoting is a serotonin or tryptophan-based plan to regulate sugar so that it's not so up and down. Am I following you correctly here? So that we've got the serotonin and the endorphins in the picture. The potato is designed to enhance serotonin production. Yes. The taking the sugar out is designed to reduce beta endorphin spiking. Exactly. Okay. And so then if we add the Nicole Avena piece with the dopamine, we've got the whole story of addiction, don't we? Well, yes. Yes. Okay. So, I mean, what it tells me is that, Kathleen, you know, with all due respect, your work was seminal in the uh, 90s. And we got to bring you back so that we hear the other side. We're not just hearing the dopamine piece. Well, I know the problem is that we're now we're old farts. And <laughs> so that it's, it's people like Clarissa that are going to bring back this idea and move it forward. And one of the questions that you uh, brought up earlier was, what is the next step? And I think part of the next step is to bring it back to addiction intervention and why this is so significant that people are able, what my experience is, is if we take care of the food part, that people are then able to use all the other resources, whether it's 12-step programs or treatment or self-help or all the things. We didn't have that 30 years ago. Right. right. And now we have it. And so it's like food can be underneath whatever else you're doing. So this seems like a nice segue into the next piece that I was hoping we would talk about, which is kind of your solution, your seven-part plan, treatment plan. Did you want to elaborate a little bit on that? Because here we are, Clarissa and I working in the addiction field, basically using the dopamine model. So let's hear yours and how we can incorporate that. Okay. So first of all, I would say that the seven steps are not designed to control cravings. They're designed, it's designed to rebalance a brain that needs something in order to feel okay, which is very different 
from being cravings centered. So it's creating a brain that is has high self-esteem and impulse control, which is different from controlling cravings because I rarely talk about cravings. Well, cra- they, cravings is dopamine. Well, it's, it's also beta endorphin and the beta endorphin precedes the dopamine reaction. So if you raise the beta endorphin and you take out reactivity, people don't have cravings. And so they're not driven by that. And this, what the seven steps do is create stability, create biochemical stability, create the ability to say no, and then to use life tools to take the ability to say no. And if you have a feeling, not have to do something. So if you have discomfort, you don't have to take it away. You can sit with it. And that the seventh step out of these steps, and it's really having three meals, not having sugar, having a potato. After you do that, then what you do is actually hard because you're having to learn how to live life without drugs, without alcohol, without all the foods you've used to amp it up, but that you can do that in a way which is thoughtful, reflective, and stable. And people just get so excited to have a sense of confidence about it, that they can do it. They won't relapse. Or if they relapse, they won't slide down a slide and never come back, or they won't get fat, or they won't commit suicide. And that's so to me, the problem with my program is that it's too simple. People say, well, how can it be that simple? Why is it not super expensive? And the people who have done it never say that because they know that this creates a level of change that is simply not imaginable until you try it. Okay. So you mentioned uh, in your plan, this is a question that I wanted to really ask. So, and you, you brought this up. One of the components of that is to eat three meals a day. So what's your take on the current almost craze fad intermittent fasting and fasting like one meal a day or no meals or very restricted time. What's your take on all of that? I don't think you're going to like it. (laughs) That's that's fine. We're, We're good with this. I think it's crazy because if you fast, your body thinks you're starving. Yeah. And if your body thinks you're starving, it releases beta endorphin. And then you feel lean and mean and strong and competent and you want more of it. And that's what they say is the keto buzz. That's what they say. But you're right. I I, I actually happen to agree with you that I actually, when I read your book again, it was like, oh my God, I remember reading this years ago, that starvation leads not just to ketones, but also to an endorphin experience, which is a pleasant experience until it wears off. And until it wears off. And that is the issue. So if I came back to you and said, look, you could do this just slightly different. Eat. Eat enough, eat on time. You don't have to eat. You're not going to binge. You're not going to be out of control, but you're going to be steady and you're not going to be going up and down. And also you're not going to be getting a beta endorphin rush from starvation. And I, my biggest concern is that people get enchanted with restriction, Vera, and they don't know that that, and restriction is addiction. It's seductive. Yeah. It takes away your sense of self and you're not being nourished. So my approach, I mean, and it's so, in some ways, it's so irreverent that it's like, just eat food, eat vegetables. You know, I love vegetables. We totally agree about vegetables. I love cauliflower rice, but eat enough food so you're not in a state of starvation. Yeah. Okay. Well, so you're not in with the intermittent fasting, maybe not so much with the keto. How are you feeling about the vegan plant-based world? Might as well get the whole gamut here. I just wish they weren't quite so righteous. <laughs> All right, we've you got, know, like, we've look, got I, I'm, I'm irreverent. Mm-hmm. And now, well, I want to tell you, in our community, we have vegan plant-based people who they eat leaves. That's what they eat. And I said, okay, if you can get these guidelines of this much food, eating leaves, I'll support you on. And we had a big fight about it when we when they first started because I was I wasn't as tolerant as I am now. And they taught me a lot about okay, if if on a spiritual level I agree with doing plant based eating. But on a body level, 
I'm an Irish girl. <laughs> it's like Irish people can't just eat leaves. And so, and I'm, I'm not meaning to be as irreverent as it sounds, but I really want to meet people where they are. And if someone says, I really want to do a plant-based diet, then I'll say, let's figure out how you can get enough to eat. Okay. Um, so, so now let me just, I know we want to ask about the sodas and stuff, but let me just, do you believe, you said that there, everybody is sugar sensitivity is a good thing, but that the excess of that is sugar addiction. So do you believe that abstinence of sugar is an essential piece of good mental health? I'm talking about refined sugar, extra sugar, not fruit sugar. All right. So you need to know I would never, ever use the word abstinence. Okay. Ever. I hate it. I hate the word. I hate the concept. Do you hate I the idea of sugar addiction? Because it's so grim. It's grim. That's what it is. Like, the, how about joyful enjoyment of food? Let's talk about what you can, what you can have rather than you have to not have something. And I have, I just get very, I get upset by people being beaten up about being bad and the righteousness. So many people come to me and they're so wounded by the message that they're bad and they can't abstain. And I say, look, don't even think about that. Think about what you can have. What foods do you love? Where are, put avocados into your life. And it's a different style that I want to have people have a love affair with food. But what, if their, not love affairs, do, what if their love affairs with chocolate and with uh, donuts? But the chocolate, well, first of all, I'm not, <laughs> we'll come back to the chocolate in a minute. Donuts are not food. That's junk. Okay. So I'm not suggesting that people eat junk. I'm suggesting that people eat really more like what keto people eat. I mean, in reality, we're so close together. The reality of what I'm advocating is eat whole food, good food. Yeah, I think we are together. Tasty yeah. food, yeah. fun food. Don't eat junk food, but you can have joyful food. And then we get to chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> I'm reading food journals that everybody's having a little piece of healthy chocolate. And I thought maybe I should be eating chocolate. I, If I have a little bit of chocolate, I want more. Yeah. So I don't eat chocolate. I don't eat things that make me feel like if I have a little, I want to lie in a bathtub with it. I just don't go there. Okay, well, we call that frank out addiction. So if I said to you, and you were my clinician, would you say, if I said to you, can I have this in moderation, what would you say? This is uh, a trigger food for me. Okay, what is it that you want? You want chocolate in moderation? Uh, well, yeah, well, or a little bit of cake once in a while. I'll tell you exactly what I said. I just talked to somebody this morning. I said... Yeah. Why don't you try that and see what happens? I can tell you what will happen. I'll eat the whole cake. Well, then do you want to have it? And I will say that is a choice. I'm not going to be prescriptive. It's a choice huh. that when that choice comes from you okay, and you say it isn't worth it to me. Now, it might be worth it to you. One day you might you might have some and not find out. See, the thing is what I want people to do is to find out if you have it, if you have a piece of cake, you're not going to die. It isn't, you're not a bad person. You just have a piece of cake. For God's sakes, all you did was have a piece of cake. What are you going to do today? So that if you were coming to me as a client, we'd be laughing and I'd be saying to you, Vera, what was behind your having a piece of cake? What was that about? And we would talk about your having, feeling the need to fit in or feeling like, Oh my God, it's Christmas. My grandmother used to make cake, whatever it was. And we'd heal that so that you don't have to have cake in order to have those feelings. Which we then call abstinence, but you don't call it that. So we have a term for it, but you don't call it that, which is fine, right? To each their own. I know, but see, abstinence just... It does seem like an antiquated terminology. I absolutely it, it, can... To me, I, I'll tell you exactly what it evokes. It evokes a... 21 year old registered dietitian sitting and, and telling me that I'm bad because I won't just go off of everything all at once. That's the kind of feeling in my stomach of sadness rather than talking to me about what I can have and what I can do and teaching me skills. And I 
I personally think the language is important. And also, I think there's lots of space for people to have different approaches and to, uh, yeah, to do it yeah. differently. Because for sure, for some people, when I say you don't have to try to moderate these foods anymore, that can also bring like a sense of freedom to them, right? To just be like, oh, I don't have to have that fight anymore. These are just not my foods. Those are like quote unquote drug foods. So now I'm just going to stick to the real foods and try and experiment with all these things. So you are right. Clinically, you have to figure out who you're working with and what terminology they will be able to connect with in order. Is this going to create that deprivation brain or is it going to create freedom? Because for me, finding out like you don't have to try to figure out how to eat these foods. I was like, thank, like, thank goodness. Right. right. And I think when people who need to be told what to do, who want to be told what to do, what foods are right and good and what foods are bad, they're very uncomfortable with our steps because it's too, it's not prescriptive enough. And I say, let's say, go get gray sheet and do that. <laughs> and, and I'll tell you how to do it in a way that will keep you sane. Yeah, And we'll laugh at it. But, you know, literally, I have had people go off in a storm because I wouldn't tell them what to eat or I didn't have a sheet to tell them what was allowed. Or I wouldn't talk about step seven before they were doing step three. Yeah. I mean, what it sounds like to me is we're probably sim- on similar pages, but it's a different approach. So I do come from a gray sheet, which I guess is more of a paternalistic, you know, you do this. And you're coming from a more, I don't know, bedside manner, you know, go with the client approach. But I think we're ultimately saying the same thing. Okay, that's a great, what an interesting thing to think about. No, see, I wouldn't say that I say to the client, you decide what you want. I'm actually, I just think the boundaries are further out than that would be my thing. Because I want to create empowerment where people are not looking to me to decide for them what they do. And that there's there's a way of rhythm and mutuality. Yes, yeah, that sounds uh, good. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a nice thing to think about. It. And I think having a dialogue about it is wonderful. Yeah, because I think it does create change when they make that decision to stop using that thing all on their own. Then they yeah. don't even think about it or obsess about it anymore. They're there. They've they've reached that level of acceptance. Right. So I'm wondering if you can speak to us a little bit about the diet sodas. What's the addiction there? Do tell. Oh, I can tell you about diet soda. So phenylalanine is a precursor to dopamine. So if you drink diet soda, you get a dopamine hit. And particularly if you drink diet soda that is caffeine and phenylalanine together. Now, the reason I know this is I have a body that is, you give me a diet Coke and the next day I will want more at exactly the same time of day. And the only time in my life I have ever felt suicidal is if I've had diet Coke for three or four days and then I don't have it. And I feel suicidal. And that got my attention. And I said, okay, there is something about you take a sugar sensitive person who, you know, sugar sensitive people in my mind are sort of drama puppies. And you put that dopamine hit into a drama puppy. And then the person is in withdrawal from phenylalanine. They're going to think, this is too big. It's too much. I'm going to kill myself. And I've experienced that. And I'm not depressed. And I'm not suicidal, but I have had, and I've tested it enough because it was fascinating to me. Why did I just have a thought of driving my car into a tree? And I, you know, addicts do things until they figure them out. And I, so I had this thing about, oh, just give me a Diet Coke. The world will be good. And that's a place where I really learned about dopamine with Diet Coke. And that's why I have such a funny uh, relationship with it. How do you work with people around the weight piece? Because I imagine they come to you and it's really, first off, they want that diet, right? So the diet's all about losing the weight. So I've heard you talk about, you know, not really focusing on the weight, but focusing on the radiance. Can you speak to us about that a little bit more? Yes. No one is interested in achieving radiance. They just want to lose weight. Okay. So we want to be clear (laughs) that radiance is not a concept that comes in 
until you have some biochemical stability. You can't, you can't even imagine what that is. And I would say 90% of the people that come in want to lose weight. Now, they want to lose weight right away. And what I say to them is, okay, you've been dieting your whole life. And they, they all have, of course. And I say, what we're doing is going to teach you maintenance first. And you don't get to do weight loss until you're on step seven. So it's that will come. And then what happens is they do the steps. And one of two things happens. Either, no, first they do step one and they gain some weight because they're eating breakfast and they freak out. They gain 10 pounds. And we, we have a whole process of calm down, stop it. It'll be all right. And if they can get through that first pump, then down the line, they get through step six, which is taking the sugar out. They're having regular meals and they forget that they wanted to lose weight. Isn't that fascinating? That's fascinating. Because all of a sudden they have self-esteem, they feel good, they're exercising, or so either they forget and then they stay a little on the tubby side. And they, you know, notice that many of the people that have been around for 20 years are a little bit on the tubby side. And that none of us care. <laughs> it just doesn't it isn't that underlying hum of you're a bad person. Or they say, I want to lose weight, and they come to me. <laughs> so I say, you can do how <laughs> wait in a flash. Just do that. I know I don't often say that, but if you want to lose weight, eat more vegetables and eat smaller portions of your, I mean, it is so simple to lose weight if you're balanced. And I have a whole weight loss program and there's a lot of laughter there. And I love the fact that people are not obsessing that their life is being defined by the scale because that's the purpose of it uh -huh. and being free from that. And I lived that for how, you know, I'm an old person now and I don't know how long, 60 years is a long time. And I do not feel that now. Uh -huh. so. you, know, you, you mentioned the concept of radiance and, and you've mentioned the 12 step program. So when you say radiance, I think, Oh, that's the 12 step equivalent of the spiritual uh, awakening. So yeah. what, what is your relationship with 12 step? Like, is that something that you encourage people to use or do you see yourself as offering a similar program or like, what's your take on that in relation to the work that you do? I love 12 step programs. I recently have been doing some research about that, that the 12 steps of AA, which is kind of the foundation, came down from Jung and uh, wasn't just from Bill W., but it came from Jung. And Jung got it from St. Ignatius, who wrote A Lifelong Journey. And so, and it's all guys, guys doing, saying things. So it's a two edged sword because. I have never encountered anything in my entire life that is more profound and more spiritual than giving your life over to a divine process, being in service, taking personal responsibility, helping other people, admitting that you're wrong. So I love the principles of the 12 steps. And I think they can be used to brutalize people and put people down and turn them off and disenfranchise women and people of color. And I have done a lot of 12-step work, but not in, you know, I don't know. It's like they're both together of, it's the most powerful thing and the most frustrating thing. And so I think what we're trying to do in Radiant Recovery is I can't do spirituality directly. We just do it by how we live. So... No, uh, that, I, that's not a very clear answer, but it's it's because it's sort of no. I think it's good. It has to be again. It's it's individual, right? That is either the community for you, or that's not your community. So you need to find another one if you find it to be that negative. Have that negative impact on yeah. you. Yeah. Absolutely, for a lot of people who feel that way, I've heard that. So I mean, it's great to hear you say that. Absolutely. Well, I also celebrated fifty years of sobriety, so that you know, gives me a claim to a long time of thinking about it. And as we do I just, it, yay, yay, good for you, you know, yeah, I mean, that's a, it's not something that I talk about a whole lot, mm. but the idea of, and when we were wrong, promptly admitted it, that really touches my heart. And I want to live that way. Like if I, if I mess up, I want to be able to say, no, that wasn't good. I, I don't want to do that. So it's, 
I mean, you're asking me, I think COVID kind of put me in a place of reading more books than I usually do. And this whole journey of looking at where where 12-step programs did not start in Akron, Ohio. And those of us who are scientists and go back and say, where did this come from? And reading that Ignatius, St. Ignatius's rules for doing life are so similar to the 12 steps. It is bizarre. And what St. Ignatius says was he, he was told that by the Virgin Mary. Now, Kathleen does have the idea of, now, wouldn't that be an interesting little book? Put that out there about the origins of that so you can hear me. You can you can edit this out if you like. I'm being a little irreverent. So. Now, we are interested in your book on little sugar addicts. And like we have so many people that are listening and that's the number one thing they struggle with in this toxic food world we live in of convenience, ultra processed foods. How yep. do we help our young ones? What are some steps that you suggest to take? And, you know, how do we help kids eat less sugar? Don't buy it. There's another irreverent response. Yep. <laughs> well, I, yes, parents don't think people they can do and that. Ask me that question of like, wait a minute, who has control over what comes into your house? Right on. Yes. Yeah. So, like, come on, guys. You, if you don't buy it, they're not going to eat it. And now I'll tell you, I have seen a huge change in the last 10 years about children and how we do this. And before people were just horrified that their kids could be little addicts. My daughter told me she thought it was a terrible title and she didn't want to think of her children as addicts. And younger people, now my daughter's older than you, Clarissa, and the younger people, they're okay with it. They give their kids water. You can say no now because they have done recovery and they say, no, we're going to have water and we're going to have fruit and that junk food. We're going to have real, real food. So I have thought about rebranding Little Sugar Addicts and trying again and seeing if we can, because it's a very funny book and it's a very useful set of concepts that I think just was before it's time, to be honest with you. Well, actually, you are an amazing example of not before your time, but definitely you've been speaking before this almost bandwagon of sugar addiction. I mean, you were a voice you broke through the public, to the public. I don't know, yeah. you were a bestseller. Like, I- uh, Yeah, well, that was a surprise to me. I mean, think about, you know, here's an unknown person and that what that book, did. I mean, the book is still has sold a half a million copies. It's not sexy. Nobody particularly knows that. Nobody particularly thinks about it, except the people at Simon & Schuster who say, let's do another edition of this and <laughs> update it. And that book is still selling regularly because one of the things you were talking about with me before, because doctors and therapists give it to their patients and clients and say, read this. And people read it and say, oh, that sounds familiar. Yeah. Well, if I can just urge you to rebrand whatever you want to do with that to little sugar addicts, because we need to, we need to, it's, it's the little kids that are going to become the next generation and they are becoming an, a generation of addicts. Anyway, Chrissy, you want to take it? Yeah. I just wanted to say, what would you say to the, like, we get this feedback from the eating disorder world that by labeling like foods with sugar as bad, we're creating eating disorders in this younger generation and that we shouldn't be restricting any of these quote unquote oh my God. foods. Yeah. I, <laughs> I knew you'd right. have something spicy. You, you'll get me so riled up about that idea that I'll yeah. probably go write something up. like, good. That's ridiculous. Just say no to them. Like you could give them give them art supplies, give them experiences, you know, buy them a dog, get them a dog, let them learn how to do clicker training. Sugar is not love. Love is love. Oh, just see what you've done to me. (laughs) I wouldn't put up with that ridiculous argument for 10, there's my, for 10 there's, seconds, there's my, there's my sugar saying, right there. Exactly. Yeah, that's my that's sugar. Exactly. Bump. Look at that. <laughs> and you have a cat as well. I mean, it's, oh, look at what you've done to me. See, I would just laugh. 
Like, what do you mean you can't say no to your children? What do you mean you're teaching them the restriction? No, it, the restriction that they learn, some of it is very healthy, which is you don't have to have soda. You can drink water. You can say no to getting pregnant. It just don't even get, oh, okay, you, you have this and that interesting to push that button. All right, got any more problems you want me to solve? <laughs> I'm excited to see where it goes. What are you, speaking of this, what are you working on next? I'm working on staying alive. I had a little <laughs> COVID scare in my family, and I was waiting for the outcome of my COVID test. And I had a life-changing experience of like, Oh, I had, I, I'm not ready to die. Like, I, I don't want to do this. And uh, that got me mobilized. I actually, you'll laugh, uh, Vera, you'll particularly laugh. I went and renewed my bibliographic software. <laughs> ah, <laughs> and yeah. they said, what version do you have? You know, it's now EndNote 20. And they said, what version do you have? And I said, four. <laughs> but I thought, I have something to say about stuff like that. Like, this is too important. We need, those of us who are elders now, we need to be saying what we know and what we've learned. So I don't know yet, but I know I didn't die and I didn't have COVID and I was humbled to my core and I want to be in service. So that will be, more will be revealed. You know, your wonderful questions will go back and start. Oh, Uh, now that I have a bibliographic program and that we have, here's the other thing. I have been talking to people all these years and they're still around. And I still talk to people all over the world. Every week we have conversations and, you know, I'll talk to somebody in Tibet and I'll say, how did you get the book? And they'll say, oh, my sister sent it to me. And they say the same thing, like this changed my life. And I I want that to continue where people really get what community does to change our sense of isolation and how be connected and the kind of work you're doing. And, you know, here we are sort of coming back to it and saying, you don't have to have your power taken away. And that's what sugar does, takes away your power. It It's an illusion that it comforts you. Or that's what restriction does. It takes away your power. So talking about how we can how we can have a a feminine spirituality that isn't woo-woo, that's rooted and informed and smart and thoughtful. I love that. That That was was good stuff, Kathleen. I want to read it. (laughs) I want to read it. (laughs) So we have a signature question. And it is, if you could tell a younger version of yourself something about sugar addiction, we'll use that word, or sugar sensitivity, what would that be? I think I would say to her, oh, for God's sake, stop worrying about being fat and just live your beautiful life. I think that's (laughs) what I would say to her. Like all that energy wasted. Mm. And I would also say to her, what a miracle you are. Like, come on with me. Like, I I, I don't know when you put that in the thing that I read. I was so moved by how she figured out all that stuff. I don't know how she did that. I mean, Mm -hmm. I was going to school full time, working full time, raising three children full time by myself. And like, if I met somebody who was doing that now, I would say, how can that, how can that be? So I think I would just sit with her and have a cup of tea. I mean, then it doesn't, that sounds ridiculous, but, and just say, well, what are you thinking about these days, Kathleen? And I just sit and listen. That I, I guess that I, I don't mean to be so, it's just such a miracle to not regret your life, to think that you, you were asked to do something by grace and you showed up and you did it. And how unusual is that to be able to be at the ending of your life or that? Yeah, I'm, I, I'm not planning on dying, but you know, if you're over 70, if you're, I'm over 75 now. So that's, you know, that's at the edge to be able to say, you know, if you have a dream to do it, because you'll be guided and taken care of. All right, I'll shut up. That's, that's Kathleen, good. I, I got to say, I, I have so enjoyed speaking with you. I enjoy your irreverence. 
And uh, you really do seem like a model of that radiance that you talk about. Mm -hmm. I just want to say thank you so much. Thank you. Well, that's mutual. And this has been a wonderful thing. And we, I love that we have my dogs, <laughs> your dog, your cat. Yeah. And it doesn't matter. We can just not be flapped by it. That it's sort of, they're in there waiting at the door for me to open the door. <laughs> so thank you. And let me know if there's anything else you would like or need. And uh, I'll do some thinking about the questions that you asked. Thanks so much, Kathleen. Okay. Bye. Thanks for joining us this week on Food Junkies, Recovery from Food Addiction. Make sure to join our Facebook group, Sugar Free for Life Support Group, I'm Sweet Enough. You can subscribe to our show in iTunes or Stitchers. That way you'll never miss an episode. While you're at it, if you found value in this show, we'd appreciate a rating on iTunes. Or if you'd simply tell a friend about the show, that would help us out too. Don't forget to pick up your copy of Dr. Tarman's book, Food Junkies, which is available on Amazon. If you have any additional questions, both Molly and Clarissa are food addiction professionals and work one-on-one -on -one with clients. You can find their websites and email addresses in the show notes. Be sure to tune in every Friday when our new episodes drop. As Vera loves to say, the power is ours. <laughs>